Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's A Plus Study Group. I'm James Messer from ProfessorMesser.com. And those of you that are live are joining us here on Ustream and in the chat room. We're going to go through a number of topics this month that you have provided to me over emails and in the chat room and uh, the questions that you leave for me when you registered to take this. There's a lot we're going to go through. Uh, so let's get started. I'm going to jump right into things so we can really go through. I've got a lot of topics that you were able to provide to me uh, this month. This is a monthly group. I like to get together live. We get online. I've got the chat room going here live. You're able to see the questions that people have left to me, and we'll go through these pieces of it. Um, I want to thank you very much for joining these. I did one of these a couple of months ago, and it was open. The idea was that these would be only for people who have purchased my training course, but I got such good feedback, I thought, well, let me just go ahead and do a big streaming session every month. Just open it up to whoever would like to join. Plus, that helps me justify getting a little bit more equipment. So I need more lights and more cameras and more computer stuff and more mixers. And what better reason, I think, than to have a streaming session every month. So I like that as well. If you would like to uh, see more about our course, if you want a course that you have to be able to take along with you to watch all of our videos in high definition, there's MP3s, all the slides are in PDF format. I even have formats on there for your mobile device. You can see more about that at professormesser.com slash download dash A plus. So first I want to say thank you. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, really last week, I was just leaving London. I was there for a, a CompTIA invited me to come to a conference and speak. So uh, I showed up there and was talking about the website and the cool things you guys are doing and a lot of the social media things that we're working on. And uh, we just had a great time. And one, the speaking at the conference was fun, and I got to meet a lot of people there. But since I'm in in London and I have the opportunity to actually meet you. It was really nice. I got to to sit down with a lot of you and go to the pub and and uh, and see some of those those things as well. It was a really really a good time uh, was had by all. I think uh, I like the fact that we went out and did a lot of those things. That was that was a lot of fun too. So uh, a good opportunity to meet you guys and plus it was also helpful um, in, in London to have a good time with those things as well. It was really a lot of fun. So uh, next time, I will make sure you're aware. In fact, CompT even said, you know, we're doing a conference in Vegas. And I said, Vegas? Well, we could certainly make arrangements to go there. So that was uh, something we may be doing in the future as well. And I've got uh, all those pictures out on the Facebook page, so please go out there and have a look at them. So the idea on the streaming session is that I would sit down with all the questions you're sending me. And when you register for this, you sign up for that mailing list, you put a question in there. And I take uh, this big list of questions and I pare it down and I try to find some themes of what people are asking for. So there were certain things that always pop up or come to the top where a lot of people are asking the same thing over and over again. So we got, well, maybe not millions of questions, but we got quite a few questions that came in. Um, the one that perhaps was uh, the most telling was this one from KM. It all confuses me. I agree. It does all confuse me. Um, and so that is perhaps the biggest reason to do these streaming sessions so that we can take some of these things that just really drive you crazy and drill into them. Uh, I only have so much time. If you watch my videos, these videos are 15 minutes each. They're 20 minutes each. You really can't spend a lot of time on any particular topic. So one of the things I'm hoping to do with this is perhaps get past the point of it always confusing you and drilling into some of those pieces. So. Let's go and talk about some of the questions you've had this week or this month about some of this exam content. And the one of the ones that came up a number of times, and really a theme that I think this will be for the month, is drives, hard disks, storage, connectivity for that storage, how you plug in that storage. And a good one came from uh, Faisal or Fazel. What does PADA and SATA do? You know, these are terms we often hear, especially if you're buying a new computer. They'll talk about the SATA connectivity, the SATA 1, the SATA 2, the SATA 3. You've probably seen, certainly for your A+, things that you've been studying for, all those topics. You've seen PADA. You've seen SATA. But there's these other terms, too, like ATA, like uh, IDE. Those things are in there as well. So what I thought would be good if we just broke them apart a little bit. 
and how to look at this. And this is going to lead us into some other things relating to how disks go together and how we can make disks more redundant and resilient. Uh, the standard for PADA, we'll start just with PADA. And in my world, I'm an old guy, I go back so many years that it used to be called something completely different. This used to be called ATA. In fact, it used to be called IDE when I was first getting into it. The, the AT side of things uh, really came from that IBM computer. One of the very first ones was the XT, and then they upgraded it to the AT. And one of the first jobs I ever had was taking hard drives and installing the very first hard drive into a PC AT computer. People would not buy their computers with hard drives. They only had floppy drives in them. So one of the things I would be uh, required to do is take my 20 megabyte hard drive, and it was enormous. It was, it was this enormously large hard drive that you would put inside of the PTAT case, which was a very large case. It's kind of hard to show you uh, on the, the screen that's here. It was a big machine. Uh, and we would in, I would install them. And there was a lot of mechanics involved. You got screws and mounting and putting it in there. And it used a standard connect, connection to be able to talk to the motherboard. And that was this integrated drive electronics. In reality, the, the controller part of the drive was actually on the drive itself. We always think about the hard drive controllers being on the motherboard, but that's not entirely true. The motherboard's really just a connector that gets you into the drive and the drive itself has that controller associated with it. And that's why we call it an integrated drive electronics for that. Uh, in fact, you'll see a second version of that was called Enhanced IDE. You may see it referred to as EIDE because it was something that Western Digital came up with. They created these standards and started working with them. And, and there was a number of different standards associated with that. We started with slower speeds. And as we migrated through time, those changed. And in fact, we started calling them ATA drives for the type of connectivity they have. And only once the, the SATA drives, the serial ATA came out, did we go back and, and retroactively rename ATA. So now we hardly ever call it an ATA drive. We call it a PADA drive because we stuck the P for parallel right in front of it. But until SATA came out, there was no PADA. We just called it ATA. We just knew that all the ATA drives were parallel. That's just how they worked. And there was no reason to put the P in front until the SATA came out. So that was one of the things that, that was uh, very telling about how we work with these, these uh, abbreviations in our industry. Sometimes we don't even realize that we used to call it something completely different because now they're just PADA and SATA. That's how it works. It makes sense to us. The drive itself or the connector itself on the motherboard, not so big, just this tiny little connector that you're plugging into. You're, you don't have a separate card. There's not a lot of separate electronics associated with this on the motherboard because this is integrated onto the drive for the most part. This is really just a physical connection to at least get you onto the bus of that motherboard. Uh, and it's very simple. On the back of the drive is also a similar connector that you're plugging the other side of the ribbon cable into. And all of those bits go across that ribbon cable and back all at once. That's the parallel part of it, that all of those are going back and forth at the same time. That's why we have those big, fat ribbon cables. But those big, fat ribbon cables carried a lot of data. But part of the problem, of course, is they take up a lot of room inside of the computer. And these days, you're dealing with these very, very large servers. If you go into a data center, a server might have I don't know, 20 hard drives, 24 hard drives in a single server, or even more. These larger machines that are designed for storage have many more than that. But all of these drives are just lined up in there. And if we were still using those big, fat ribbon cables, it becomes very, very difficult because there's no room inside of the device to run the cables. They are getting in the way of the airflow. There were a number of issues associated with it. And at the end of the day, it actually became a slower way of communicating. We found a faster way to communicate and, and use our connections to these drives. And that faster way was called SATA. So that's how this, this serial ATA came about. Now, for those of you that go back to serial connections on a computer and parallel connections on a computer, you, you may remember that parallel was always faster. You could get a lot more throughput through parallel. But in actuality, that's not entirely the case. You can, you can have serial go much faster and use a much smaller type of connection, which we're going to look at in a moment. And in fact, that's the one that hard drives now go with. There's is a serial, serial ATA is a serial connection. Now, there's, there's three standards of ATA that you need to know about for your A-plus certification. You can 
Notice there's the SATA revision 1.0. I'm not even calling them versions. I'm not even calling them SATA 1 or SATA 2 or SATA 3 because you not only have to know the revision number of SATA, but you also have to know the speeds associated with those revision numbers. So if I call something SATA 3, am I referring to SATA revision 3 or am I referring to the SATA revision 2 that happens to go at 3 gig per second? See the problem there? So I try to always say SATA revision 1, which went at 1 and a half gigs per second of total throughput, gigabits per second. SATA revision 2, has a total throughput of 3 gigabits per second. And the latest version, SATA revision 3.0, can uh, put through 6 gigabits per second. And I try not to also use 3G or 2G, like first generation, second generation, third generation as well. So if you're looking at things to remember for your certification, that is one of those. You'll certainly want to keep that in mind. One of the nice parts about SATA, though, once we started putting these into our systems, especially a lot of them, they take up a tiny little amount of room. You can see along the corner of this motherboard, move my mouse over here. Maybe I can actually point it out for you is on this motherboard, there are these tiny little connectors on the corner. And those tiny little connectors are the SATA connectors. You remember the PATA connectors were these nice wide mini pin connectors. One of the advantages of being serial is that we don't have to have all of those pins on a single port. And so if you look at the back of the drive, it'd probably be a little bit easier to compare. Here's our PATA on the left and SATA on the right. These are both the data cables. See the enormous difference between those two. So it's very, very important to keep that in mind as well. SATA not only a faster standard, but it takes up a lot less room. And on a motherboard inside of a computer, that amount of room is incredibly valuable. It's very important, that real estate that we have on the motherboard. So that's that's also very useful for your airflow because you're plugging in the this single little tiny cable, and it's allowing more air to go through as well. It keeps those temperatures down just as Ann White is saying in our chat room. The back of the drive, this happens to be a drive that can support both power of, of the old Molex style power and a SATA type connection power. The, the left side of this, which is actually very big, I don't know if I can, can highlight that or not on here, I can't, but one of the ways that we do this, looking at these connections, is they're, they're very large for power on the Molex side. But notice the SATA also got the power much smaller as well. In fact, the power connector on the SATA connection here is much bigger than the data. So that's a very interesting uh, part of the standard is that a lot of the power going into this is taking up more real estate than the actual data that's going by. I I'm not using the power for the SATA in this picture. I'm plugging in the data, and I'm using the old Molex connector, which is a really good example of how you can put in a SATA drive into your computer, maybe add a separate controller card, and now still use some of the old power in an old power supply. If your power supply does provide you with that SATA connection, though, that is ideally the one you should be using for that. There's a lot of advantages to be able to do that. So that's that's my overview of PATA and SATA and how they work. In the, in the chat room, Jamie was asking, is Molex just for power supplies? And it's, it's a term, this term Molex is one that we use to describe that very particular connector for power inside of a computer. The reality is Molex is the name of a company. And they have many, many, many different types of connectors and many, many, many different products. I mean thousands of different products. But the one that's inside of our computer for that Molex connector is one that we've just called this four-position, four four-port power connector. And you can plug in a lot of things in your computer. You can plug in uh, fans and hard drives and other types of connections inside of your system. If you've got other things that need to be powered up, like DVD-ROM drives, those can also be powered with those connections. And, and as we're mentioning in the, the chat room, other types of connectors. If you want to bling out your system, plug in some LED lights, add some additional fans, uh, plug in some monitors for the power, a USB connection for media in the front, a lot of things you can do with that. It's a very standardized way to get power into your systems in your computer. Uh, I think that one of the the important things that people ask me a lot is how can I get a book that that really narrows down exactly what I need to know for the exam. One of the things you've noticed uh, in our our uh, our course so far online is that there's videos that really go all over the place. There's videos at the very beginning, and if you look at the format I do for my videos, they're in order from top to bottom of the way that CompTIA's requirements documents are. 
but that's not necessarily the best way to watch them in a book. And one of the nice things I, I partnered with and one of the sponsors of the study group this week is GTS Learning. They have an A-plus book, uh, and I was they, they were nice enough to give me one of these very early on. I looked through it. It's a very comprehensive book, but one of the things I really like about it is that it also has a, a check mark on there uh, from uh, CompTIA saying CompTIA has looked at this book. We like what's inside of this book. We approve this book. And then they have a lot of other courseware as well that's CompTIA certified. So if you're looking for a really good A-plus book that focuses on exactly the things that you need to know for your certification, uh, this is a great place to go. If you want to find out more about that, even download a sample copy so you can see for yourself, feel free to visit them. Go to professormesser.com slash A plus book, and you can fill out a form there and get one sent to you immediately, and, and you can try it out. See for yourself if you like that book or not. Uh, let's now move on to looking at other types of drives. I'm going to take a drink here so we can uh, see some of those things here. Uh, I want to talk about RAID. I want to talk about exactly how we can look at RAID. And I also want to calculate some things associated with parity as well. Jeff sent me um, the note for this that said, uh, explain the differences between RAID levels. And Jeff was not the only one to ask about this. Uh, as we were going through all of the list of questions that came in for the study group, that was one that kept coming up over and over and over again. So I thought it'd be worthwhile to go through that a little bit since we're on this topic of disks and hard drives. Let's, let's look at some of these things. And you've probably seen this before, but how does this really work? And I want to give you some practical examples of how you might use this in the real world as well. This is a, a, a RAID stands for, it's actually an abbreviation that stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. Um, you may also see this called these days Redundant Array of Independent Disks. And I think the disk manufacturers prefer that second terminology. But originally, we talked about inexpensive, these drives being relatively inexpensive. And the difference at the time, of course, is we had these enormous drives on mainframes and on many computers that were very, very, very expensive. So on the PC side, one of the big advantages that really drove PC usage early on was that they were relatively inexpensive. And I could have multiple drives inside of a computer and create redundancy and, and create faster systems to store data. It, it made perfect sense to be able to do that. There's three RAID types you're going to need to know for your A-plus certification, RAID 0, which is striping, RAID 1, which is mirroring, and RAID 5, which is striping with parity. I want to really focus on parity in this month. There's other types of RAID formats as well. Uh, some of them are standardized. Some of them are unique to different manufacturers. But one of the, um, the ones that you want to focus on for A-plus is the 0, the 1, and the 5. Now, the, the first one we'll talk about is RAID 0, which we call striping. And the why we call it striping is because we've effectively got two physical drives, and we're, we're separating how we're writing the data. We're taking half the data and writing it to one drive and taking half the data and writing it to the other drive. And offhand, you're thinking, wait a second, that, does that make a lot of sense? Do we really want to split our data off onto separate drives? A byte goes here, a byte goes there, and have it set up that way? There may be some very good reasons to do this. However, one is that you're able to get some very high performance out of this. One of the things that takes a lot of time for these moving disks that we're talking about, this doesn't necessarily refer to SSD, I'm really talking about hard drives in this case, is that it takes a long time to read and write data from these drives. So if I can split the job of writing to the data to separate disks, Ideally, or, or I guess theoretically, it could almost happen twice as fast because I'm only writing half of the amount of data to each individual drive. So that's great. I can put one block on one drive, one block on the other drive, and just split back and forth between them, one after the other after the other. Now, one of the problems with this, and you've probably picked this up immediately, is that if you lose a drive, you're done. You're toast. You're history. You're Memorex. No more drive for you. There is no redundancy in RAID 0. So if somebody asks, which, uh, which RAID format does not provide you with any redundancy whatsoever, that's your answer, RAID 0. Because if you lose a drive, that's it. Your data is gone. So just because you're doing RAID, and this is an important thing to keep in mind. This is an important thing because a lot of people forget this. If you lose a drive, it's out of here. Just because you're doing RAID 
doesn't mean that you should stop doing backups. You should always do your backups. It doesn't matter if you have RAID or not. You should always, always have your backups. So keep that in mind. If you lose any one of these disks in RAID 0, no redundancy. So it's important consideration. So we would set that up if you needed that type of speed. Maybe you're working with very large files. Maybe you're working with some type of technology that requires that you do a lot of reading and writing to the hard drive. Maybe it's CAD CAM type things. Perhaps it's video editing. It's something with this lot of I.O. to that hard drive. These days, if we're looking for speed on drives, we tend to also lean towards SSD. And I'm not really talking much about SSD this month in the study group. But that solid state drive is one that's extremely fast. And if you can afford it, it's relatively expensive. So if you can afford it, that's a very, very fast way. But if you're still stuck with these types of disks, the physical drives with the spinning platters and the head that moves back and forth, RAID, Z RAID 0 might be a really good way to speed up the performance of what you're doing. Well, RAID 0 is striping, so let's move off to RAID 1, the next one up. And we call this mirroring. RAID 1 mirroring makes makes perfect sense in the name because we really are duplicating traffic. In RAID 0, we're copying half the traffic to one drive and half the traffic to the other drive. In RAID 1, we are duplicating traffic exactly in both drives so that we have an exact mirror, that's where the mirroring came from, to be able to see that exactly the identical things on both drives. Now, of course, if you're setting this up, you're going to need twice the amount of hard drive space to be able to maintain. If you need a gig of storage, then you're going to need two one gig drives to be able to do that. If you need a terabyte of storage, you need two terabyte drives. If you need two terabyte of storage, you're duplicating it every time. Two terabytes, uh, you need two two terabyte drives. So whenever you're planning out a RAID 1 configuration, figure out how much disk space you need and then double that because you're going to be using that for the mirror. Now, one of the things about this, though, is it is an exact copy on each drive. So if you lose a drive, the other drive's still there, and it will continue to run. You will probably you will absolutely get a message. Your computer will probably beep at you until you replace that drive. You'll get messages on your screen, and you will see that it continues to run normally. I have walked into a customer site that had a RAID 1 configuration running on their servers. And I, I happened to go to their computer, which was in a closet, and looked at it, and the drive light was on. So clearly, they had lost a drive. I went back into the operating system. At that day, it was, a, it was an older operating system uh, that was uh, network-based. And we looked into the logs, and the drive actually failed months ago. But they had no idea. But that entire time, since the drive had failed, they had no redundancy. If, the, if the, the, la the drive that was left over, if that had failed, of course, they would be out of business. But because they had the redundancy built into it, they were able to let these things run and run and run. They had no idea that the original drive had ever failed. So we were able to pull that drive out, replace it with a new one. And if you've ever worked with RAID before, when you replace the drive, generally these tend to be hot swappable. It's one of the advantages you have on many RAID arrays. Check your manufacturer to make sure that's the case with yours. But if it's hot swappable, we just plug the new drive in and the RAID array recognize, oh, this is a new drive. I'm now going to take everything on that, that drive that was left over and start copying it all back. So in the space of a few hours, you then have everything back synced up again, and you have the redundancy back to be able to use that. Uh, there is no real, real effective um, speed increase from this because we're effectively writing this data. And if we're really in an environment where we're using this and doing it quickly, you almost need multiple controllers so that one controller isn't having to handle the writing for both of these drives. But it's one of those things that you can not only have in hardware, you can have RAID happening in software as well. So some of those situations can also be very, very advantageous. So you don't have to have required or extra types of controllers. You simply do it all in software. And if you have to replace the drive then, you generally have to power down, replace the drive, power back up, and then your operating system recognizes there's a new drive there. So that's one of the nice parts about RAID 1. You don't generally lose data. So the question is, is it OK to stop doing backups? Okay, it's not even a trick question. No, you should absolutely continue to do your backups. RAID 1 will, of course, help you if you lose hardware, if you lose a drive. But what if somebody accident accidentally deletes a file? 
When they delete the file, it's going to delete them from both of these disks. They are mirrored. There's no way to go back in time and do that unless you set up something previously to back up those or keep a mirrored copy or keep a shadow copy of that or keep revisions of those going back in time. You also have to be careful for any other types of problems. If you happen to have a power supply blow, if this gets hit by lightning, it could take out both drives at the same time. So just because you're doing RAID doesn't mean you should stop doing your backups. Always, always, always do your backups. OK, so let's look at now uh, another RAID, RAID 5, which is striping with parity. So RAID 0 was striping. We were copying information, separating it across multiple drives. But one of the problems with RAID 0, of course, is if I lose a drive, I'm out of business. There's no redundancy. So one of the things you can do is just add another drive into your RAID array and use that drive for something we call parity. And this parity is going to allow us to ma maintain and continue to run even if we lose a drive. So the advantage here is I can have all the advantages of striping, which is the speed associated with that striping function. The parity adds the redundancy piece to this. So let's look at exactly how something like RAID 5 works. If you were to see all of these different disks, you would see in here that, that normally with a RAID 5 configuration, you're striping to a disk, and one of those you're putting parity on. But for the data you're putting on here, you don't have to put parity all on one particular drive. You can mix it onto other drives as well. And this is an example of how one manufacturer might do the RAID 5 configuration. One thing to keep in mind is not all manufacturers use exactly the same formats when they're doing RAID configurations. In fact, single manufacturers with different firmware in their RAID controllers may be using different methods. So generally, you can't take a set of drives from a RAID 5 configuration and put it into a different manufacturer's RAID 5 configuration and expect it to work. It will not. So that's where our standards in our industry fall down a little bit. RAID is a way of doing things. It's not a standard for doing these things. So keep that in mind as well. But having that parity there gives you the ability to stay up and running if you lose a drive. Well, how does that work? And that was exactly the question that came from Dan S., which was, how does this parity work? Parity in RAID? I don't even understand what we're talking about there. So I thought it would be good if we became the computer and we started to build our parity for our drives. So let's go through an example of how you would do this. One thing to keep in mind, by the way, you don't have to know the mechanics of this for your A-plus exam. But I think understanding it will get you to realize why the parity is so useful and how it becomes redundant for what you're trying to do. So let's step through this exercise. In um, in RAID, the type of parity that we use in RAID is something called exclusive OR or XOR. This is often sometimes called even parity, which is the way I like to think about it. With even parity, you have parity across the disks. And that parity then has to be able to, to work in a way that you're able to get an even number of bits on each side. And here's how this would work. Let's say that here's a scenario where I'm running RAID 5. In this particular RAID 5 configuration, one of the drives is going to be dedicated to parity. This is a little bit different than the picture we were looking at earlier where the parity was mixed between different disks. But just for simplicity's sake, I'm, I'm spelling it out here on the screen. I'm displaying it on the screen in a way that we can track what's going on. So let's say we have disk 0, disk 1, and disk 2. And let's deal with that top layer of data that we've written. We've written a 0, a 0, and a 1. If we had to calculate parity, we want our parity to be an even number of these things. And if I look at this, I have one bit that's turned on in all of this. That's odd. So my parity is actually going to be to add another one into this mix. OK, that's even. There's the same amount on both sides. Or the number that I'm dealing with is an even number associated with that. You sort of see how this is going. Let's look at the green line just underneath it, a 1, a 0, and a 0. If I want to even things up, I'm going to need to put a 1 in place to be able to do that. That's how we calculate parity. Not really that hard, is it? Let's do the next one, 1, 1, 1. Well, would I, if I put a 0 there, there's three 1s. That's definitely not even. I want it to be even. So to, in order to be even, I'm also going to put a 1 in place. And the last one, 1, 0, 1. Well, the number of ones is the same. The number of zeros is not the same. I don't have an even parity there. So our parity is zero. That's the process of figuring out parity. 
And as your system, these drive controllers are writing data, they are also automatically calculating the parity, and they're writing them to the disk. They're very often it's doing much larger blocks of parity, but the process is exactly the same over and over and over and over again. Now, that's how you would calculate it and store the parity, but what if we lose a disk? I'm going to change the data here. Let's say that we've got disk 0, disk 1. Let's say disk 2 crashed, died. It's not working anymore. We have a parity drive left over. Remember, this is RAID 5. If this was RAID 0, sorry, no parity drive. You're out of business. No more data for you. But since we have parity, we can backwards go backwards now to calculate what was that bit on that particular drive. So we're going to do exactly the same thing we did with our parity, but in reverse. So I've got disk 0 is 1, 1, and the parity is 1. Well, remember, if I need things to be even with my even parity, then I'm going to put a 1 right there. I'm reconstructing this drive data as we're going through here. Let's do the next one. 0, 1, 1. To keep everything even, I need to put a 0 in place. For the, the next line down, 1, 1, 0, to keep everything even is also a 0. And the last one, 1, 0, 0, 1. You probably got, had that way before I did. So there you go. You were looking at the parity in the RAID configuration. It tells you that's RAID 5 with parity. And it tells you that's redundant. You're trying to figure out, how is that redundant? It's, it's just another drive. With mirroring, it's an exact duplicate. You know that you're using an exact duplicate of drive space. But look at what's interesting about this. I did not have to duplicate every other disk. If I had to duplicate the first three disks, I need three more disks plugged into this. I would need six disks to be able to do the redundancy. But because just I added one more drive and added the parity to it, now I don't have to have quite as much storage space but still have redundancy. Now, the negative to this, of course, is we have to calculate this. There was a lot we had to do just then. We had to use our brain. There was math involved. Who knew there would be math? But you have this built into your controllers. The hardware of your controllers is very fast. So if it's a hardware-based RAID, you don't often see any performance decrease in being able to set up this RAID 5. Or if you do, it's a very, very minimal decrease in performance. Now, if you are doing this in software, you are relying on the CPU of your computer, generally, to be able to provide that level of RAID. So sometimes if you lose a drive and it has to start reconstructing things, you'll see some slowdowns associated with that if you're trying to read and write data from that broken drive. But there you go. You now understand how important that parity can, can be used to be able to calculate. And more importantly now, you realize why the RAID 5 is redundant. It's redundant because we've got that parity right there that we can choose from. One of the things that I get, it seems like half the questions I get for this study group are questions about the exam itself or questions about the questions that you're going to get on the exam itself. So I like to go through some of these. And especially, there, there's things that are happening all the time with CompTIA and things that we are hearing with rumors. And, and I will tell you right now that um, I have no relationship with CompTIA. I'm not a CompTIA member. Um, I, I don't have a, um, a membership with them. They invited me to their conference in London um, as an outsider, and I came and talked to them, but uh, I have no plans to do that. I, kind of, I like to be independent in, in most ways, so I kind of prefer being on the outside looking in. But one of the disadvantages of that, of course, is I hear what you hear. So one of the questions that came up this week was, is there any insight into new exam objectives coming in 2012? And this was not the only question about exam objectives in 2012. Joe M. sent this one in. But um, what I hear, and some of the things that are obvious to me, is that obviously the, the version that came out uh, for A+, was in 2009. And it was updated earlier this year to include Windows 7 and IPv6. And now that's almost already a year old from that perspective. And you can imagine, and, and what CompTIA has said, is generally we like to have these things updated about every three years. So one of the things that I guess we're expecting, I have no prior knowledge to this, but I certainly expect that there will be new exam objectives that will come sometime in 2012. And the fact that we've not seen them on the website yet, traditionally CompTIA has given you a little bit of a heads up 
on the website. You can see the new objectives coming before they're actually released. Um, and we haven't seen that yet. So I completely expect there will probably be an updated exam in 2012. I would imagine it's going to be well into the year. So if you're planning to take your A-plus anytime soon, you're just fine studying these materials. You probably got months before you even get to a point where a new exam is even going to be available to you. What they've done in the past is when they've released a new exam, they've given you a certain amount of time where you could take both exams so that you can study. If you've been studying for months and suddenly a new exam comes out, you don't have to scrap everything you've done just to learn the new materials. You can still take the old exam. Now, one of the advantages with the A-plus exam is you just get an A-plus certification. It doesn't matter which version you take, you get your A-plus. And now that they're renewing every three years or require you to at least have enough credits to renew every three years, you're always getting the latest materials. So you don't have to worry so much that you're taking the, the old exam, the old tired exam from a different time frame. The reality is it's a relatively updated exam just this year. You'd be taking it and you would have your A-plus certification. Your A-plus certification doesn't say, oh, you took the 2012 certification or you took the 2009 certification. It does not differentiate that way. So it doesn't matter which one you take. You're going to have the latest exam. You're going to have your A-plus certification there. So don't worry so much about that. Go take your exam, pass your exam, and you don't even have to worry about which one of those you happen to take. One of the other questions is uh, came from Pat, which is, can I pass the exam without any hands-on experience? And um, the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, you can absolutely pass the exam without hands-on experience, but it's going to be a lot harder for you. A really good example is us just stepping through the parity. If I want next uh, next month, maybe we'll do some command line. Where we're going through and looking at configurations of an operating system. When you're typing on that screen and you're seeing the feedback of what you're typing, that hands-on experience of what you're seeing on the screen, you get a better understanding of what's going on. And re the reality is you take apart a computer and you're pulling the, the cards out and you're looking at the connections on the power and you're plugging it into those connections on the back of your hard drive and you're putting the cards back onto the motherboard, um, there is an important set of things that you learn right then. You understand how all of these pieces connect together. You can see the actual the leads that are on the motherboard. You see the bus itself and how those things are connecting to each other. So yes, you can pass without hands-on experience. And people have sent me emails and said, I passed my A+, and all I did was watch your videos. But I absolutely don't recommend you do that. I recommend you get a good book. I recommend you watch some videos, maybe get a Q&A guide of some kind, and get a computer. Maybe get one that's broken, even, from eBay is a good way to do it. Very inexpensive. People are throwing out old computers all the time. And unplug it, take the power out, disconnect everything, pull out the different components, look at the motherboard, see what's on there, see if you can find the BIOS, see if you can find the CPU, see if you can identify the different components that are on the, the motherboard itself. There's a lot of value to that. So don't, don't, don't forget that when you're studying for these things that there is that side of things. And it's just going to help you if you go about doing that. So keep that in, in mind as well and, and take that into account because it can be very valuable to get some of those hands-on experiences. The, uh, this month I was looking at some links and trying to understand what are people asking me about. And, and this came up not only in London, but I got a lot of questions this month relating to the CompTIA exam objectives. And one of the questions I just answered is, can I do this without hands-on? Yes, you can. But another thing you should consider, and maybe it's something you should do before you walk in on the exam, is get the exam objectives from CompTIA. This is the CompTIA website, and, and they keep changing exactly where this is. I never know day-to-day -day exactly where the exam objectives are going to be. But if you go to Google and you look for CompTIA exam objectives, will take you right to the page. And I've got the link there on the screen. This will, uh, you put in your name and your email, and then you can choose which of the exam objectives you'd like to download. And the reason I mention this is that the CompTIA exam objectives are actually very well laid out. There are pages and pages and pages of a lot of details in their exam objectives. And they do a very good job in their exams of really staying close to those exam objectives. They don't, don't tend to go outside those lines very often, primarily because they're just so comprehensive. What I did with these exam objectives is I downloaded them, I printed them out onto dead tree paper, 
the physical thing. And what I did is I went through each topic. There's pages and pages and pages of topics. If I really understood the topic or I felt I'm ready to take the exam now, I went through and put a check mark. If I didn't know a topic, circled it, made a note of it, and I went and I tried to learn more about that particular topic. So by the time I was ready to go in and take the exam, I'd gone through 80, 85% of these had a check mark next to them. Other ones had a half a check mark, kind of knew it okay. Others, I just didn't know anything, and I felt perhaps I just not just not going to be able to learn that piece in the amount of time that I had, and so I crossed those things out. But you'll be able then to get an understanding of just how much you know and how well you think you are being prepared to go in and take the exam right away. So be able to, to take that into account as well. Get your books, watch your videos, take your sample questions, but don't forget to always go back and look to see what CompTIA says you should know before walking in to get the exam. That can be extremely helpful as well. So with that, there have been a few questions that have come through in the chat room. We were talking about a few of these back and forth, and, and people have been talking about their exam pieces. Um, one of the questions from Ann, did I pass the exam the first time? Well, my A+, plus, I did pass the first time. Um, the score was okay. That was back in the 600 series. I was kind of just getting into it and understanding it and passed okay. Um, I took the 700 exam when it came out. I didn't do a lot of studying. I just sat down, went to the exam place, and just took the exam and missed a few questions. Surprised my, I'm like, how, how can I miss questions? I've done video training courses and I've been working on the 700 course. How did I miss that? But I really didn't study. So in that particular case, I did pretty well because I had the course behind me. Um, but I, I have absolutely failed exam courses before. There were, I'll give you a story of one. I was, um, this was way back when when uh, the, the token ring networking was all the rage and Ethernet was finally becoming much more popular. And there were a series of exams called the CNX exam, Certified Network Expert. And one of those exams was on cabling. Now, I grew up in, in working with computers at the keyboard and uh, working and doing programming and replacing hard drives, as I mentioned before. But I didn't do a lot of networking. And this particular exam focused on physical cabling. Yes, category one cabling and token ring, really type one cabling in token ring would be the more appropriate way to describe that uh, with the UDC connectors. So I didn't do a lot of that. There was a separate group of people when I worked in an insurance company, when I did networking, completely separate team handled the networking. So this was a real struggle for me to try to understand the signaling types and the way that the data was encoded as it went across the cables. And there was also a bit of fiber that you needed to know, which at that time was a relatively new technology in the, the type of networking that we were doing and trying to understand the differences between all these ethernet types and the connectors that you would use and the coax, because at that time, coax was also important. It was even being used for 100 megabit connectivity over ArcNet. So we had to know a lot about the cabling. Went in, took the exam, failed it. I mean, bombed it. Not even close. There was not one of those times where if I had just made one more correct answer, no, not even remotely good with that one. So I went back. I studied some more. There really wasn't a book to study from. So I tried to understand what I didn't know, went back in, failed the second time. And that one was just a couple of questions. Almost had it. Uh, at this point, I was angry and I was going to pass and it wasn't going to stop me. So I went back and studied some more. And the third time was the charm. I ended up passing it. Uh, but it's one of those things where you just don't know the topic. You walk in, you just bomb it, but that's your learning process. That's where you know what you don't know. Now you can go out, study up on the things that were really causing you a problem for the exam, and then go back in and pass it. So it's one of those uh, times when you just put your pride to the side, your ego goes over here, you walk in the exam, you try to do the best you can with that piece. Now, other questions that came up, I want to flip back just a little bit and look for some others as well. We were talking about a RAID. There were some RAID formats. Uh, some folks were talking about where you can have RAID 0 and RAID 1 together. You'll often see that called RAID 10 or RAID 1 plus 0. It's a very good thing to keep in mind. And remember, you only have to know 0, 1, and 5 for your exam. But if you start to see those when you're doing your research and you're studying, you see those other RAID types come out, that's what they're talking about. And different manufacturers will call RAID different things depending on what they're doing. They might have a RAID 50 
well, what's RAID 50? Well, it's a five and a zero. How's that work? Uh, they have different names. Sometimes it's a marketing thing. Sometimes it's something where they're just giving it a particular name. Uh, it's one of those things that you you run into as well. As well. So one of the things that we will do, though, as we are um, doing more of these study groups is I'll always put out the call every month to send me your questions. And if you are registering for the first time, the, the question that will ask you in the registration, what is the question you want to have answered? And that's important because that's exactly where all of this content comes from. And we spent some time earlier on prior to getting the stream started today. I was in about 15 minutes early chatting with the chat room and got some great ideas from there as well. I got some to-dos that we put right in my to-do list. So I was able to, to go through that and, and really see what I could work on for next month. So anything that you're able to provide for me goes right into these presentations. It becomes extremely valuable to be able to do that. If you need to keep track of what we are doing here, you can always go to our Facebook page and see what's happening with that. Uh, you go to professormesser.com slash Facebook. I've also, of course, got the Twitter account, which is a great way to send information out and let people know what's going on. And Google Plus, uh, last week, Google Plus um, opened up Google Plus for company accounts or someone who is not a personal account. It's more of a corporate or a, a, a brand account. And I have one of those as well. So you can go to professormesser.com slash Google Plus. And I haven't, I haven't even put anything on it yet. Still trying to figure out exactly the best way to use Google Plus. Maybe you guys can give me some ideas about that as well. And if you're on Google Plus, go ahead and add me to your circle. Uh, that would be great to see as well. And that way I can see people are there and you would like to see those things. And maybe it's just a another place where I put those daily pop quiz questions so you can see those come up as well. And I'd love to get your feedback from there. Um, I, I don't think Google Plus is going to replace Facebook, which was one of the questions that came in from uh, Orion Anglo. Uh, I, I really think it is a different group of people. In, in some ways, I think it's the folks on Facebook uh, aren't happy that everybody from high school and grandma's on Facebook anymore. You still want your geeky side of things. Right now, it appears that's what Google Plus has turned into. But we'll see. These, it's very early on in the evolution of Google+. Plus. And, and if you've ever done a Hangout in Google+, Plus, I'd love to do one of those. I can only fit 10 people in there. But since I now have that corporate presence account, that company account in there, I could do Hangouts where 10 of us are just talking back and forth over the video chat. That'd be kind of fun as well. So things to do there. Too. I, I want to also thank our sponsor this month, GTS Learning. Make sure you go look at their books. I was had a chance to sit in their offices last week, and I was in London as well. We had a great time with those guys. ProfessorMesser.com slash A plus book will get you a, a sample test or sample a set of books with questions inside of them. And uh, we'll just keep doing these. Next month, we're going to do another one. And it's all because of the things that you're providing to me that allows me to put these things together. Thanks for joining us. When we see you next month, we'll take all of these great ideas. We'll put them into another study group session as well. Uh, life is short, everybody. Study well. We'll see you next time.